Good morning, and let's begin with a word of prayer, shall we? <clears throat> Father, we pray that you would help us all to understand what we're supposed to be doing here now. And we pray, Father, that you'd look upon us in pleasure through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And whether we speak or listen, we need you. I pray your blessing upon this message, the blessing of God that is needed. Lord, only you can really speak to people. Fine language and oratory won't do the job. And we pray the Holy Spirit mix with the Word of God would do the work today. In Christ's name, amen. I think first I should begin by explaining to you why I have several pieces of printout paper here. I'm going to preach from this. Now, don't stone me. Uh, it's got the Bible on it. I want to speak to you this morning from three different places in the Gospels. Matthew chapter 19, Mark chapter 10, and Luke chapter 18. Now, that's three different places in the Gospels. Now, what I did, I went to a harmony of the Gospels, and I made a photocopy of these three places. Now look real good and it'll help you. So instead of you having to run from Matthew to Mark to Luke to back, I have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in vertical columns, side by side, and I can read all three of them at the same time. Wow, what a shortcut to Texas, isn't it? All three of them at the same time, but unless you, wouldn't it be good if somebody printed a New Testament in harmony form? And then we'd have that. Maybe somebody could hit on that. So that's what I have these pieces of paper for. Now it's got God's word on it. It's just photocopied off. And as I said, in vertical columns, so I can read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all the way across, all the way across at the same time. <clears throat> all right, now with that being said, uh, the subject I have this morning could not be any more boring and uninteresting than this subject. I want to speak to you about the rich young ruler. Now that's as exciting as washing your feet or peeling a potato. The rich young ruler. If I announced I was going to explain the mysteries of Daniel's 70 weeks, they'd be hanging off the balcony. But we're looking at the rich young ruler. Now, it's not exciting at all. The subject is not. However, the message about the fellow and what he said to Christ and what Christ said to him is a different story. In fact, it's electric. And it loses the glib and the monotony of just the rich young ruler. So the preacher's going to beat us over the head about having money. You know, that's, that's a usual approach to it. Uh, that, that, that's exactly wrong. The rich young ruler. So look at Matthew chapter 19 and verse 16. Please. I believe Matthew was the first of the four gospels written. I disdain New Testament higher criticism. I believe it's a lie. I know it's a lie when I read the testimonies of the men who, who put it on paper, especially in Germany and France. Matthew chapter 19, verse 16. The rich young ruler, you can keep your seats. The rich young ruler, 16. And behold, one, that's him, came and said unto Jesus, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. But if thou will enter into life, keep the commandments. 
he said unto Jesus, Which? Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man said unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? Jesus said unto him, If thou would be perfect, go and sell that thou hast. And Christ said, Come and follow me. Isn't that interesting? Give to the poor. What a statement. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Now, we'll get to that in a moment, so stay with it. But the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. It's interesting, Mark says great possessions, Luke says very rich. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. That means a rich man that acted like him. It doesn't mean rich people can't be saved. A rich man that made his choice. And again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, with that reading, remember, it's also in Mark 10. And if you're interested, if you're the kind that follows the preacher, uh, have Mark 10 turn back and Luke 18 turn back. We're going to refer to them frequently along the road. In reading about this young fellow, this uh, rich the rich ruler that came to Jesus, there are four things I want to show you about him. And if you will put your mind into what is said about him, it won't be a bore. Four things. His story jumps out here in these verses. First, I want to show you that he came to Jesus the right way. The right way. Second, he came to Jesus the right time. The right time. Third, he came to Jesus with the right question. Fourth, he left Jesus and gave the wrong answer. Now, all of us here this morning fit into this somehow, some way, in the past or present. The rich young ruler. You know, when we look at him from that perspective, uh, some of the boredom sort of gallops off somewhere and hides. And that's what we want to look at. First, he came to Jesus the right way. Look at Mark 10, verse 14. The right way. Look over there. It's not, it won't take you two days. Mark 10, and look at verse 17. Mark 10, 17. He came the right way. Now listen to it. And when he was gone forth, Jesus, there came one running and kneeled. There came one running and kneeled. He came the right way. Somewhere in the past, this young fellow had heard Jesus preach. Somewhere in the past, in fact, everybody in the land had heard about him. And he'd heard Christ, he'd heard about Christ, he'd heard others mention Christ. And somewhere, wherever he lived, at night and day in his business or whatever, a little later on says he was a ruler. He was either a civic magistrate or a kazan or a ruler in the synagogue. And this young fellow had heard about Christ like all of you have. Somehow, some way. And he had thought about it and thought about it. And in hearing Christ, he reached a conclusion that he was empty of what Christ preached about. I reached that conclusion in May 1946 when my Sunday school teacher won me to Christ. I had no more argument, no more complaint. He was right, I was wrong. 
And so it was so urgent that he came running to Christ. He came to Christ the right. He ran to Christ. What have you been running to this week? What have you been running after this week? What have you been running for this week? You know, until everybody makes some urgency to hurry to Christ, all their other running is in vain. He came running. I found an old thing in Jewish customs and manners where the Pharisees said rich people never run because they're calm and collected with what they have. If he heard that, he broke it. And he came to Christ the right way running. You know, there are some of you here this morning, you need to wake up and run to Jesus. You're running after this, you're running after that. There are people here this morning, you can tell us all the basketball stars, the football stars, who they've slept with, how many times they've committed adultery, and you know all about that, and you couldn't find the book of Second Philip in the Bible. And you won't find it either. <laughs> Not there. You see, he came to Christ the right way. It was urgent. He lost consolation in what he had. He knew there was something else that he needed. And he ran to Christ, but more, he knelt before Christ. He came running and kneeling before the Son of God. You ever gone through that? Or did you walk the aisle in some deadhead Baptist church and sign a card and a backslidden deacon shook your hand, you were stuck under the water and told you were saved and that's it, and you're ready for hell? You ever run to Christ? I remember when I was radio announcing, I was just coming back to get with the Lord, and I went out and visited the pastor in the church we were attending. And I was radio announcing, I'd been saved years ago, I wasn't right with God, but boy, I tell you, I wanted to get right with God. It was eating on me. And we were sitting there in the living room talking, and a phone call came in. There were about five or six men there, and the pastor said, look, such and such and such and such, and they forgot all about me, and the pastor said, let's go to the prayer room quick. Now, we're in the parsonage. The prayer room was in the basement of the church. And I saw about 12 men get up and literally run to the prayer room about 60 or 70 meters away. Literally run to pray. That's never left me. And I wasn't right with God. And I was talking to his wife. And after a while, I had to go. But that stuck with me. Those men understood the urgent. You ever run to a prayer meeting? Most of you are mad because you have to come. That's how we are today. He came to Christ the right way. He ran. He was urgent. And he knelt in humility. He had no more arguments. Money wasn't his authority. He needed something he could not find. He came to Christ the right way to find it. That's the first thing. Look at number two. He came to Christ at the right time. Read Matthew 19, 22. It's a beauty. Matthew 19 and verse 22. But when the young man, what? But when the young man, he came to Christ the right, he was a young man, the right time. He came the right way, running and kneeling, and he came at the right time. Remember thy creator in the days of thy youth before the bad times come. Ecclesiastes 12.1. Remember Philip ran to get aboard the chariot. You know, there's urgency about a lot of things in life, but listen, people, regardless of who, who you are and where you're from and how much you think you know, the most urgent thing in this life, are you prepared to meet God? If you're not, you're a fool. That's it, capital letters. The most urgent thing. Because we, look, all things in life must pass away. My wife and I talk about this continue. Mother, all things in life must pass away. The end must come. Some of you have lived this week like you're going to live forever. 
and you're not. As a young man, he came to Christ. By mercy as a young man, I came to Christ. Now, I'm not hinting or suggesting you don't come to Christ because you're old. That's stupid. But I'm saying, you listen, young married people, come to Christ. Listen, young people and boys and girls that are big enough to understand, come the right time when you're young, Amen. come to Christ. Don't believe this philosophy. I had a very wicked brother-in-law. He's dead and gone now. And he used to get me out in the car and we'd drive and he'd drink beer. And he'd say, now look, Randall, he said, you got to live in sin and really live in sin and enjoy sin. Then if you ever come to know God, you can appreciate it more. And, you know, I didn't know anything, but I was saying he's a fool. I wouldn't tell him I was scared of him. He's a former prize fighter and boxer. He came the right time when he was young. Have you come to Christ? Come to Christ like this fellow? With all that he had, he knew he didn't have what, what was needed. You know, there are people sitting here today, and I couldn't talk you, if I gave you the third and fourth degree sideways and backwards, I could not talk you out of your salvation, but are you really saved? Are you really saved? You know what Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3, 3? Except a man be born again, he cannot see. I'm going to stop in the middle of the verse. He cannot see. See. And the rest of it is the kingdom of God. Have you really come? Look, have you been saved? Are you kidding yourself? And I'm not saying everybody has to have my experience and their experience. and somebody. I'm not saying that. I'm saying, have you ever come to Christ and been converted, born again. Amen. My wife and I, we knew an elderly lady. We called her um, May, Auntie Mae Browning. She died when she was about 90. She had a bunch of fine sons, architects, engineers, pilots, really fine sons. When uh, Auntie Mae Browning was dying, all the family came in and, you know, she died at home. And when Auntie Mae was dying, she kept saying, look there, aren't they beautiful? And they said, what? And she says, oh, they're shining. Isn't that glorious? And there was a couple of people there. Well, she's having delusions. Her fever's a bit high. Now, they were the delusion. That crowd was. And you, you know what Auntie Mae Brandon was doing? Man, she was looking at the angels. They were coming to collect her and take her home to heaven. Now, that's the result of true salvation. That's the result of being saved. I was called into a hospital one time about 55 years ago. And I was just a young man, went in there, and there was an old man. He'd been a smoker all of his life. All the side of his face was rotted out. You could see his teeth. It doesn't do everybody that way with cancer. Or he, was, he was a grotesque looking. And, and the nurse said, can you help him, Reverend? And I'm so young, I'm not hardly shaving yet. And can you help? And I looked at him like that scared me. To, and this old man began to curse and swear and howl. And, and the nurses had to tie him to the bed. And he died. And he was gone. And I'm going to tell you what, I was glad to get out of there. Doug, glad to get out of there. And people, we've all got to come to an end somewhere. And look, some of you think you're so smart and you've got all the answers and you can handle anybody. I want to tell you something, pal. The mouth at the foot of the grave is level. Amen, brother and sister. It's level. And I can't bring my expertise and you can't bring yours there. I'm going to tell you what, if we can't cling to the cross, what are we clinging to? Amen. To the cross and the empty tomb. He came to Christ at the right time as a young man. How wonderful. Look at the third one. This is found in Matthew 19, 16. Matthew 19, 16. Listen to this one. And behold, one, that's the rich fellow, came and said to him, Good master, what shall I do that I may have eternal life? He came with the right question. Good master? Let me stop here and explain that. In the next sentence, Jesus, what are you calling me good for? There's none good but one that's God. I looked through 12 commentaries, and except the Jewish background commentary, that's the only one that gave the answer. The other commentaries gave answers, and I was ready to ask for a tums when I read them. 
The Jewish background commentary explained it. You see, in Jewish culture at this time, the rabbis and the synagogues taught that you only call one good, and that was God. That was standard Jewish theology from the Tanakh, the Old Testament. And everybody believed you only call God good, nobody else. And this young fellow sort of slips up. And so he's some skidding out and said, good master. And Jesus said, wait a minute, fella, God's the only one that's good. So you don't have to have a nervous breakdown about it. It's very clear when we fit it into the Jewish culture. Jesus is saying, get it right, young man. Follow what you've been taught. But he had the right question. Good master, what can I do to have eternal life? Has that question been answered for you? Notice he said, what can I do? Now, on the bottom line, he couldn't do anything. On the bottom line. One of the other writers said that I may inherit eternal life. You don't inherit eternal life. Really, you don't. That I may receive eternal life. Now, that's a bit different. You can't do anything to get eternal life. You can't inherit eternal life like your dad leaves you some money or your grandmother. It's not received that way. Now, he didn't know that. And so he asked the question. Now, when he asked the question, Jesus knew all about him. In John 2, when Christ attended his first Passover and presented himself as, the, as Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah of Israel, and he purged the temple like Malachi said he would do when he appeared in the temple and everybody was upset and all the crowds gathered around, the Bible said Jesus wouldn't commit himself to him because he knew what was in all men. The crowds gathered around had a thousand questions. Jesus said, get lost. I know what's in your dirty heart. I'm not fooling with you. Jesus looked in this man's heart and Christ knew he was sincere. He was honest. He had come right. He'd made the right approach. He had the right question, but he had a problem. And so now Christ begins the procedure of dealing with the thing that was going to damn him. And probably it did damn him, though he came the right way at the right time. Now notice what Christ said. Verse 17, we read that and talked about that. Verse 18, he said, Jesus, in the end of 17, Jesus said, young man, you keep the commandments. You're a Jew, you're under the Torah law. Keep the commandments. And the young man said, which? Now in the Jew, in the Torah, in the Jewish law, the Torah law, there's 613 commandments. Exactly. Infrequently, I phone one of the rabbis here and we talk about this. 613 commandments in the Torah law. Still today, Maimonides wrote about it. It's in the Talmud. And this young fellow said, which? Now James said, if you keep them all and break one, you broke the 612. So you who are trying to get to heaven by keeping the Ten Commandments, you're not going to make it. You are trying to get to heaven by not committing adultery, and I don't say and commit it, but if you think that's going to get you to heaven, you're not going to make it. He said, which? He wasn't trying to pick a fight. Which? Now notice Christ named six of them. Let's read them here. Verse 19. Which? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and mother. And this is not in the Ten Commandments, but it's in the law. Apart from that, thou shalt love thy neighbors thyself. Now look, and the young man, every time Jesus says something, he shook his head. That's right. That's right. Notice his response. The young man said unto him, all these things have I kept from my youth up, but what lack I yet? Some of you are a member of the church, you've been baptized, you're doing this, you're doing that, and you're doing the other. But there's, a, there's something eating you on the inside, something's missing. What do you lack on the inside? You're lacking something with all your qualifications, with all your abilities, with all your talent. What do you lack? Now, he wasn't mean. Lord, I've done, there's six, I've done all six of them. What do I like? Do you know what Christ was doing? Christ was taking him through what he was looking to for eternal life to show him that won't bring eternal life. Have you ever been taken through what you believe for eternal life and suddenly the Holy Spirit showed you you didn't have eternal life? 
About 30, 35 years ago, I was invited by Prime Minister Ian Smith and went up into Rhodesia and preached to all this. Rhodesia is no more. You know, the international community, excuse me for swearing, you know, the international community gave it to be liberated. And I went up in Rhodesia and preached and um, uh, they, they had meetings arranged. I went to a place called Rusapi. It means the resting ape, Rusapi. And I went there and there was a little Presbyterian church. And the pastor came to our meetings, and he was very nice, about 35 years old, said, Reverend Pike, on Sunday morning, will you come and preach in the Presbyterian Church? I said, I'll be glad to. Now, I know what a lot of you said, oh, I wouldn't compromise. I would. If they'll shut up, I'll let them have it. Right? If they'll shut up, now, they, they shut up on this occasion. So when in there, and I brought a simple message on Acts 16, 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. There were about 40 people there. And thou should, just a simple message. And uh, uh, I talked to them about being saved. And over there, the people are very courteous. When, when, you come, when you pull up in front, they all come out and open the door and welcome you. And when you leave, they follow you to the car and open the door. And that's, that's old-fashioned British mannerisms and custom. And so went out, and he opened the door, and his lovely wife was there, and two little kids. And he said, thank you for so much for coming. We appreciate it. And his wife walked up and said, and where are you speaking tonight? I said, I'm speaking in the Civic Center. She said, oh, that's right down there. Now, remember, I'm talking about what do you like yet. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about Rhodesia. That's no more. He said, oh, the Civic Center. He didn't say anything. Went to the Civic Center that night, and there was about 500 Rhodesian troops there, soldiers. And I, I didn't know who else was there. I mean, they were packed in, no air conditioned. It was hot as blazes. And so, boy, God unplugged my heart. I knew those men, some of them were killed the next week, killed the next month, when they were fighting terrorists that had been sponsored by American tax dollars. And believe me, that, sponsored by American tax bucks, I wrote Strom Thurmond one time, and I said, Senator Thurmond, I said, stop this. And he wrote back, and he said, we can't stop it. And so I gave a message, and I got down behind the, the stage was about that high. And I walked down to the edge of the stage, everybody bow your head, and as I began to pray, I said, keep your heads bowed, anybody wants to be saved. When I said that, I felt something touch my arm. And I looked up, and there stood the Presbyterian preacher and his wife. And the wife, he had his head down, and the wife said, Reverend, can you help my husband? He wants to be saved. Amen. He lacks something. We came in on furlough. I went to an old-fashioned, independent, Bible-believing, non-compromising, premillennial, missionary-minded church east of Atlanta, Georgia, and preached. And you know who got saved? The pastor and his wife got saved had a row in the church and the church spit. He asked me about it, said, you don't need to be with that bunch of hypocrites anyhow. You see, people, people sitting in churches, many people sitting in churches are as empty as an upside down bucket. Some of you are, but you put up a face. You're kidding yourself. Your brother so-and-so, you got your 19-pound Schofield Bible under your wing. You can chase a Jehovah's Witness and Mormons. They'll get on their bikes and never come back to your door. But let me tell you something. Down inside of your heart, there's a dark room. There's an empty spot. Up in the balcony, there's some things missing, and you know it. And this fella knew it. And he said, hang everything. I've got to have help. And he ran to Christ. He knelt before Christ. He was young. He said, oh, Lord, help me. Christ just showed him that what he was looking to wouldn't do the job. He needed something else. Do you know what his big problem was? A thing called repentance. Repent. Metanoia. You know your Greek, you know repentance. Metanoia. Repent. Repentance. You know what his problem was? A problem a lot of people in Baptist churches, they don't know what a repentance is. That's right. That's right. They think repentance is just, well, I'm sorry, I'm going to do that anymore until you have your next fight 10 minutes later. Now, his problem was repentance. When we talk about repentance, everybody gallops off to Young's or Strong's or Vines or A.T. Robinson or the Hebrew, the Greek or the French or whatever, you know. And that's all right. We all preachers do it. But, you, you know, let me tell you something. Do you know there's a feel called common horse sense that we can learn from, too? Amen. Unless you got some horse sense, your Greek and Hebrew won't help you very much. Unless you got some horse sense. 
let me give you a horse sense meaning of repentance. Turn or burn. Takes a few minutes for the penny to drop, as the Australians say. Turn or burn. You know what repentance is? Repentance is when God is mad about your sin and you know it and you side with him against you. You say, God, I'm siding with you and it's killing me. God, I'm taking sides with you. Send me to hell. God, I'm lost. I'm sad. I have no more arguments. Look, people, what's wrong inside? It's missing. And you've tried this and tried that and tried the other. And it hasn't filled the spot. Have you ever been converted, born again? Amen. And I'm not preaching, trying to get church members. You know, we came in on furlough about 30 years ago. There was a famous evangelist going up and down the south. I don't know where he is today. I hope he's, hope he's in the woods and that never comes out. And he specialized in going into churches, putting everybody on a guilt trip so he could put in his letters, 40 church members got saved. I'm going to tell you, that's blasphemy. That's de demonic is what that is. Now, this young fellow, Christ took him through it, and he said, what lack I yet? Now, you ever, do you, look at Christ's answer. Look at verse 21. Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, right in line, mature, correct, doing the job okay. If thou wilt be that, go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Now, so that means in order for you to get right with God, you've got to sell your house, sell your car, uh, eliminate your bank account, put on some rides, go sit on the street, hold a sign, and you'll go to heaven. You know, in the South, many, many years ago as a, as a boy and as a young man, th there was a doctrine that was prevalent, and if you're poor, that's a sign God's with you. You know, that was in the South. And a lot of the preachers would get up and beat people over the head for having something and beat them over the head for having something. Now, I want to tell you something. There's nothing wrong with having things if things don't have you. Right. But that's the problem with a lot of you people right here. You've got things, and buddy, they've got you. There's nothing wrong with having money if money doesn't have you. There's nothing wrong with having a good house and good car and good holidays and good anything if they don't have you. But this is the problem with American fundamentalism. It has us. Right. We don't have it. Right. Ask some of these evangelists, as the Australians say, that have to live on the smell of an oily rag sitting right here. That's an Australian expression. Christ said, you want to put it right? Sell what you have. In other words, Christ is saying, let's call him, let's call him Simon. I don't, I don't, that's, Christ says, Simon, here's what your problem is. Your problem is your money. You've come right, you've come at the right time, you have the right question. Simon, your problem is not that you're mean to your wife, mean to your kids, mean to your neighbors, your ruler in civic service or the synagogue. You're doing a great job, but your problem is you have something big and it's your wealth. That's what you've got in Simon. That's going to damn your soul. And Simon, you have got to get rid of that. And when you get rid of that, then you will have eternal life from me. Let me give you an illustration. I had some books years ago. I've given most of my library away. Mom and I are getting ready to go to heaven. We're giving stuff away. Now, some of you are going to have a heart attack sideways on that one, aren't you? You don't know what that means. You're so spiritual. You're so close to the Lord. I had a book written by a uh, group of Civil War chaplains when they went through the Civil War. It's a little stubby thing, real thick. And I didn't go through it all, but I went through the sections of peculiar events. And I remember one of those chaplains, chaplains his name was Elliot, a northern chaplain. And when he, when he moved into the South, he told of an event that happened that will explain what this rich man needed to do, but he wouldn't do, and explains what a lot of you need to do, but you're not going to do it. You've heard enough preaching in this church to save the world a thousand times. And even God's not going to budge some people, they think. And th this, uh, th there was a very rich farmer in the South Cotton Man, plenty of money, plenty of slaves, everything. And he had one black slave that was a saved preacher. And he tried to witness to him and he would tell him, shut up, get to your work, shut up, get to And he'd witness and witness. And in fact, he got mistreated. He'd witness and witness. And one day the Holy Spirit got on the farmer's case. 
and he went to bed, he couldn't sleep, he's out on the farm, he talked to his wife about it, his kids weren't interested, and one morning he looked out the window and way down there in the hog pen, now being a southerner, I can relate to this, and he saw the black man down there climbing through the barbed wire with a big bucket of slop to feed the dirty, stinking pigs. I'm talking about being willing. And he ran out of the kitchen down there and he said, Sam, Sam, I can't stand it any longer. Please help me. I got to be saved. You know what Sam said? Sure will, boss. And he put his feet and pulled the bar bar up and said, said, what I got to do, Sam, it's killing me. He said, you got to crawl in here and lay down with these here pigs. And he got down and started crawling through and halfway through, Sam grabbed him by the seat of the pants and said, no, sir, boss, you just got to be willing. Now, that's where some of you are. You just got to be willing. Be willing. Not give up, not abandon, not surrender unless it's evil. You've got to be willing. You know, the Bible still said, our Calvinist friends, they lay square eggs on this one. And Brother John Owen's interpretation would win a place in the Guinness Book of World Records, the stupidity section. The Bible still says, whosoever will may what? Yeah. You know, look, people, a gift has to be received unless you knock him down and make him take it, doesn't it? If I want to offer you a gift, I'm not going to take it. Well, I just knock you down and stick it in your pocket. It don't work that way. This young fella had to deal with the thing that was holding him back. Within itself, his riches weren't wrong. They gripped him, and therefore it became wrong. Listen, what is it you haven't dealt with? What is that sin? On that computer and that pornography, does it have you? Does it have you? What about down at the job, that person, that individual? Look, people, we've got to deal with our side with God against me. We've got to come that way. And until we do, we're going to ride along, ride along, have a little blessing. Everybody gets excited. Next week it's over and over again. Let's move over into the realm of common sense. You know, common sense, nature's a good teacher. Nature's been trying to teach America some things. Amen. Burning down on one end, drowning on the other. Nature. Right. Or they get on Fox, you know, fair, balanced, and unafraid, except when they lie half the time, you know, and you suckers believe it. And they, well, this, we call Reverend so he said God, so this be him for telling the truth. I want to tell you something, nature is a good teacher. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, doth not nature teach you? Nature teaches you never step down in the water to see how deep it is. Nature teaches you sensible. Listen, nature teaches you never slap a man in the face when he's chewing tobacco. <laughs> now, is that a practical lesson or not? I mean, you should try one. See how it works. Nature has all kinds of lessons. But we, nature tried to teach Christ church. Tried to teach Iceland and fire. What a combination. Nature's trying to teach. Nature has humorous lessons. Like the lion. Walking through the jungle, found an oxen, jumped on it, ate everything. And he was so proud for the next two days and nights. He went up and down the jungle, roaring and screaming, roaring and screaming. He was proud. A hunter had enough, took a rifle and shot him dead. Now somebody in the balcony is saying, well, Mr. Pike, what can nature teach us from a stupid lesson like that? A very good lesson. Which is, when you're full of bull, you better keep your mouth shut. <laughs> you see, there's, there's some practical things here, too. When we look at the, this young fella came with the right question, I want eternal life. Jesus says, all right, you've got to get rid of the thing that's key. You love more than you'll ever love God or anyone else. That's your wealth, your riches. And the Bible says he went away sorrowful, for he had great riches. Now I'm going to close. We're going to enjoy the Lord's Supper. Some of you are going away sorrowful this morning from me. You've been away sorrowful for months and years here. You're going away sorrowful because you won't deal with this snake or snakes inside. Now life will soon be over. We came through the door here last year. One of the elder men shook my hand, greeted me, Pastor Miller phone said, Brother Randy, you know he fell dead with a heart attack. I was shocked. Shocked. What a cheerful greeting. He'll never shake a crippled man's hand anymore. 
Life will soon be over. All of you. What are you going to do? You want to get right with God? Or are you so non-compromising you can never do that? You want to get right with God? You want to come clean? You'd never walk these aisles because you teach Sunday school and somebody might see you. I was in a meeting in Houston, Texas in 1958 and the champion wild steer roper of West Texas preached a big old cowboy named St. John. Six foot seven. He preached. I'll always remember that. What a service. And in this church were, I mean, professional people, all kind of people. You know the invitation he gave? And don't worry, I'm not going to give it because I'd be hung before I got home. You know the invitation he gave? He said, everybody in this church who wants to get right with God and you can get on your knees and crawl to this altar. Now you're mad. Get on your knees and crawl. And look, I was standing there. My eyes were about that big. And here they come. I remember there was a rancher there. You know how these guys dress with their boots and hats and this funny little necktie. And that guy came crawling down. And he got hung up in his necktie. Threw it aside. And they crawled. And you've never such howling and weeping and praying and confessing their sin. It, I'm not talking about a charismatic nonsense. People turning flips in the floor. I'm talking about real conviction. When people are sorry and afraid and they're running from their sin, they're repenting. They want to turn. They don't want to burn. What about you this morning? You want to act? You want to do something? In 1958, I went to a schoolhouse out in the Tennessee bush. Dirt road school out. One of those old school houses with a coal stove. You know, you put the coal in, raise the top, and you're smoked out. Went out there one night to preach. And I was working with a man in a, in a shoe heel factory named Herman Nixon. I said, Herman, I'm going to preach my second sermon tonight. Will you come? He said, I'll be there. Herman went out. I didn't have anything. I was so scared I didn't know what to do. And I, gave, I said some kind of dumb thing. And I said, everybody bow your head. And about that time, I heard somebody, help, I want to be saved. And I looked, you know, what? And Herman Nixon, had little benches about that, he jumped flat-footed over that bench, ran down to the front, hit his knees and skid. And you don't have to come down here to be saved. And skid in, and Herman Nixon was saved before he ever stopped. Look, people. The Holy Spirit used to work and move and convict, convict and, and, and challenge us about our sin. But we're accustomed to it now. You know, here's a man and he belittled his wife and mistreated his wife. And here's a wife and she won't shut her mouth five minutes to give her husband a chance. And here's young people, you disrespect your parents, your dirty clothes in the floor. You won't pick up your dirty clothes. You won't wash dishes. And you think you're not right with God. You're stupid. That's what the problem is. I'm talking about being a common, old-fashioned, everyday Christian that's got some courtesy, some humility, and some decency, and not a stinking know-it-all. Right. Why are we today? I was visiting in a home one time, and one of the young boys came in and said, I'm bored, I'm bored, I'm bored. His daddy was a preacher. Now, I didn't say anything, it's his home. I'm bored, I want to do this. I looked outside and the grass was about that high. I thought, you dirty rascal, you ought to kick your rear and get out there and push the lawnmower for two hours. Right? Get the vacuum clean and clean the floor. Run the weed eater. Rake the leaves. You know, excuse me for swearing, work. You know, W-O-R-K. Showing what we are, how we're made. We're right with God. God doesn't save you by work, but he saved you to go to work. Well, the rich young ruler. What a boring subject. But wow, the story about him is rather different, old chap, as we say overseas, isn't it? Rather different. Now, if we did give an appeal, an invitation, would you respond or would you not? Well, you know what? I'm not going to give one. I'm going to leave it with you. And I pray God will eat you up on the inside. Just eat, do a job on you, a good one. And you'll have to call one of these pastors or call me or call somebody or get your wife say, honey, call a preacher. I can't stay. Now, that's when we're getting them saved and they stay saved. And I'm not talking about they lose it either. That's what we got to go. The rich young ruler, he came to Christ at the right what? The right what? Way? At the right time? With the right what? Question? And he left with the wrong answer. The rich young ruler. Let's bow our heads and pray, shall we?
Father, we ask you that by the Holy Spirit, who is here now in this time of grace, he shall glorify me, he shall testify of me, he shall convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And Lord, we pray he do that work into every heart. You know us. And Lord, for whomsoever this little message is designed, I pray that they'll surrender. In Jesus' name. Let's keep our heads bowed. In Jesus' name. Now. Listen carefully, and I'm going to be through and ask Pastor Stephen to come around when I'm through here. Now listen, I know God's speaking to somebody, I don't know who, somebody is here this morning. He's talking to somebody about something here this morning. The Lord is. I know that. You. All right, he's speaking to our brother right here. Let's keep our heads up. Come on. Come on right now. Our brother's come. Can I give a testimony? You can give a testimony, brother. I... Yes, you sure can. Come on, let's look. Our, our brother here. He, can you all hear me? Yeah, no, you, you, you can okay. talk through that. I'll keep it in my pocket just so you don't pull me across town. Um, this, this is not like me, so you, I guess you can open your eyes. And um, I'm not making this up, but last night I was, it must have been about 11 o'clock, listening to a message, and I won't say who it was, uh, on hell. And, uh, and the thought crossed my mind that, that if the Lord showed me for sure that I wasn't saved, this is the thought that crossed my mind. Would I be willing to, to come in front of everybody and get saved? Now, I've asked the Lord to save me. I, I've asked, you know, there was a time where I, I specifically just said, Lord, I'm not going to deal with... Um, assurance. I'm just not going to keep asking you to save me. And I've talked to Pastor Miller about this. And, um, you know, I, there was a time I can remember I was upstairs right here in this building. And I said, Lord, if I'm not saved, I claim the blood of Christ for me. Hmm. But I needed to answer this question today. If it was I going to be unwilling to come before the church, if the Lord said, you're not saved, would I be willing to do that and just say, uh, if that's what it takes, if that's what's holding me back. That, that was the idea that was, I was dealing with last night. I don't know why. And I went to bed, didn't sleep that great. I think it was too hot and too cold and all that. But, but when our brother was saying, you know, what's going to hold you back or something like this? What's holding you back? Uh, uh, you know, I, I don't care what. I'm not, I'm not going to hold back. Mm. And uh, if it, maybe it's just a testimony of saying, there's nothing that's going to keep me from, if the Lord were to show me clearly uh, that I needed to get saved, there's nothing that's going to keep me from, from saying that. I don't know if, how this all fits, but I don't, know if it's, I don't think it's a coincidence that he's preaching this message. And I'm at last night at 11 p.m. thinking to myself, would I be willing, if the Lord showed me clearly that I wasn't saved, would I be willing? Well, the point is I am here. That's why I'm here. And all i got to say is if there's anybody else... Hmm. There's something there that, that's holding you back. And trust me, I, I don't do this. I never do this. This is not me to stand up in, in, in front of you all. But if there's anyone that, if there's anything that's holding you back, you just run to the Lord. Sure. Come on. Amen. Come on. We have the Lord's Supper tonight we have to. Anybody? God speaking to you? You see, he's a, yes, that's all right. Here, just talk. Talk loud. Last November, this is not like me. Last November, my wife and I had a cold coming down from the throne of God. And Christ to our knees and repentance. Jesus is screaming this world, repent! 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 Six, seven churches, Revelation, repent! Thank you for the service. Thank you. Amen. Repent. We might have a meeting here before it's over, Mike. Might. Mike. That it? Now, you, some of you are going to leave here very sorrowful with another brick on the load of a troubled... You're going to leave here like that because you won't, you won't obey. I appreciate the guts of our medical doctor here. He just, you know, I don't care what you say, here I am. That's the way it ought to be. All right, Pastor Steve, come. Oh.